very warm wel welcome to Churchill College. I'm Fran Mallory, Development Director here, and a warm welcome to those joining online as part of the Alumni Festival. Um, there's various people that are joining us on Zoom today. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce two Emeritus Fellows of the College who will be speaking on the topic, Corbusier Comes to Cambridge, um, which is about the buildings of Churchill College. Um, the first speaker is Professor Mark Goldie, um, and he came to Churchill in 1979. He was Professor of Intellectual History, and he's also been a Chair of the History Faculty, and he's written extensively on the College as its unofficial historian, and um, he may mention a couple of the books um, that he's published. Uh, Professor Martial Echenique, who's our second speaker, came to the College in 1972, um, and he's been Head of the Architecture Department and is an expert in urban planning and has influenced many of the building projects that have taken place on the site. Uh, now, Mark is going to start off by speaking about the competition to build the college um, and the original buildings. Uh, Martial is going to follow by speaking about modifications that have taken place since the 60s. So um, I'll just hand over to Mark now. Fran, thank you very much for that introduction. Churchill College, its architecture is very distinctively modernist. And when you first glance at it, your reaction is probably typical 60s architecture. And of course, that's because these styles are very familiar to us. But what we need to recapture is the shock of the new, because this was the first major modernist project in collegiate Cambridge. It was the entry point, not only in Cambridge, but for British higher education, the entry point of modernist architecture. It began with a competition to find an architect in 1959. And I'm going to dwell as much on what was not built as on what was built. The architect here who built the college is Richard Shepherd, but the fact that it was a competition meant that a large number of contemporary British architects of the 1950s who were knocking at the door of academe were involved. And the fact that it was a competition meant that it was a very public affair. Most projects, even large projects, do not, did not involve competitions to find an architect. And as I say, what was not built is important because the schemes that were unsuccessful in the competition at Churchill were very largely exported to campuses elsewhere in the great boom of building of universities in the 1960s. Most of the architects of the so-called Shakespearean seven universities, so-called because they're named after characters in Shakespeare plays or appear to be Lancaster, York, Sussex, Warwick University and so on. Most of the architects of those universities had competed at Churchill in 1959. And so it's for these kinds of reasons that the architectural historian Elaine Harwood has called the Churchill competition the most important competition in post-war Britain. And there's a wonderful photographic spread on the college in the middle of her book called Space, Hope and Brutalism, English Architecture 1945 to 1975. So these, this is characteristic of uh, the style of the college, of course, large expanses of unadorned brick and the characteristic horizontal beams of concrete. This is the entrance to the college and this is the dining hall, that wonderful cliff of brickwork with the over, uh, over rather sculptural, over-engineered chunks of concrete for the ducts uh, and for the roof at the top. Well, I'm not here to persuade you of the loveliness of brutalism. You either love it or you do not. And of course, uh, the reputation of 60s art uh, architecture waxes and wanes. In fact, there's been a whole slew of books on British uh, and world brutalism in recent years. It's very much in fashion. Perhaps its telltale is boarded concrete of which you can find all around the college, behind you in fact, above you, there. And it's an effect achieved by using high quality planks of wood um, in the shuttering for wet concrete 
so that the concrete sets showing the patterning of the wood in it. And it cre creates some beautiful effects. And if you're an architectural buff, you'll notice that practically anywhere you see this, you can date to just about one decade from about 1958 to 1968 when it was popularly used. It's in fact a very expensive and laborious technique that has to be done on site. Well, as I say, I'm not here to debate the pros and cons of um, brutalism, though I will uh, emphasize that one of Shepard's great achievements was his wonderful use of uh, feel for texture, feel for the quality of materials. This is the interior of the dining hall with its wonderful fluted Canadian uh, hardwoods. Uh, it's quite stunning. But I'll just give you one example of those who are doubtful about brutalism. There's a wonderful little book called Boring Postcards. It has not a word of text in it at all, but its argument is carried by its selection of images. And it consists entirely of reproductions of postcards of buildings from the 1960s. And it's page after page of motorway service stations, uh, shopping malls, corporate headquarters, and bang in the middle, Churchill College, Cambridge. So that's boring postcards uh, for one opinion on the college architecture, not my opinion by any means. Now let's go back in time a little. Um, British higher education in general was extremely slow to come on board with modernist architecture. Until around the end of the 1950s, early 60s, universities and colleges were extremely cautious in their choice of architects and architecture. And one huge opportunity was missed in 1937 when uh, Gropius fled Hitler in Germany and came to Britain and designed for Christ's College, this was beyond Hobson Street, uh, a building for them. Christ's immediately took fright and refused to build it. And so Gropius, uh, having fled Germany, then fled England for lack of uh, lack of employment and went to settle in the United States. So that was a lost opportunity. And in the post-war period, some very boring stuff was built in collegiate Cambridge. This is King's College Garden Hostel, um, extremely dull. Uh, this is a building at um, Pembroke College, extremely dull. Only at the end of the 50s, do, do we see a turn? And it's not true to say that Churchill was absolutely the first. The really important first modernist building in collegiate Cambridge is the Erasmus building, uh, in a very sensitive site, of course, on the Cam Queen's College by Basil Spence. And of any architect, it's probably Basil Spence who made modernism acceptable to a mainstream British audience, particularly via his uh, Coventry Cathedral, which was opened in 1962 and for which he's best known. He's very much part of the Churchill story because he was the chairman of the judges of the competition. The zeitgeist moves mysteriously. Very suddenly in 58, 59, 60, uh, you get turning points in several colleges and several universities. This is St. John's College, Oxford, which booted out its um, uh, earlier, older architect and got in a new architect to build what are called uh, the beehives. So the competition was held at Churchill in 59. It was a career turning point for many architects who were involved. It was a limited competition. At first, the toy, they toyed with the idea of a completely open competition, but the college trustees took fright at the sheer scale and time that that would involve. And so the com compromise was to invite 20 architects to compete. So 20 were involved and four would be shortlisted. And that 20 was the cream of British modernism. If you look at those architects, many of them would be knighted in due course. Their buildings would become listed buildings of architecture and importance. One thing that must be said of them is that they were all British. The trustees put their foot down on that matter, feeling that the national memorial to Winston Churchill had surely to be designed by a Brit. 
So it wasn't possible to go abroad and make the decision, for example, made for St. Catherine's College in Oxford, which in many ways is the parallel and contrast with Churchill College, built for many similar purposes and at the same time as Churchill College, where the architect is the Dane Arne Jacobson. Uh, this is one of the very few post-war British buildings that listed grade one uh, in importance, I think rightly. And it's interesting to see the contrasts and much of the architectural literature draws the contrast with Churchill, a very different kind of modernism, much more rectilinear, rational uh, in its layout, geometric, and with what you might call a thin skin surface with curtain wall glass, rather than Churchill College's thick skin of brick and concrete. Well, I've mentioned the trustees of the college. There were no fellows in 1959. There was still no college until the following year. There were some academics on that body, but most of them, chaired by Winston Churchill himself, were a bunch of um, men of a certain age who were businessmen, who were Second World War uh, hero soldiers, who were retired politicians, and they had hoped to have uh, no competition at all. They did insist, as I say, on there being a Brit to build the college. But what's fascinating is how they were outmaneuvered. They would certainly have wanted a mixed ticket, a balanced ticket on that list of 20 to be invited, some traditionalists who might build something near Georgian or whatever, but they didn't get it. We know that Winston Churchill himself wanted something neoclassical. He was probably dreaming of Blenheim Palace, where he was born. And his secretary said that he would be very disappointed, the Winston would be very disappointed, if something was built that merely pleased the modernists. It's reported that Winston said, when am I going to hear the sound of chisel on stone? And the reply from the architectural review was, he's more likely to hear the gloop gloop of the concrete mixer. So how were the trustees got around? There was a kind of um, running rings around them. Well, the key figure here is Leslie Martin. He was the great impresario of British architecture in the 1950s and 60s, handing out uh, commissions here, there, and everywhere. Enormously influential figure. The first professor of architecture in this university, appointed in 1956. Didn't build a very great deal himself, although famous for his iconic festival hall. And in Cambridge, especially known for Harvey Court in West Road that was built in the later 1960s. But he was the impresario here in the competition. It was he who ensured uh, who would be selected to compete. And he showed a lot of slides to the little committee, the building committee of Gropius, work by Gropius, work by Alva Alto, Frank Lloyd Wright and others. He also, uh, if I may so call it, had um, a, a sidekick, Sandy Wilson, Colin St. John Wilson, who would become the first fellow in architecture in this college, much later would go on to build the wonderful British Library building at King's Cross. And incidentally, in 1960, built a lovely uh, modernist pair of houses at number two Grantchester Road, which some of you might know. Well, the brief by the Architectural Building Committee was a very interesting document, November 1958. It explicitly said, invited people to make buildings for our own time. It was a steer towards the modern. Buildings, it said, also for 500 years, buildings that would last. But at the same time, it gave quite a traditional steer towards the traditional layout of colleges in staircases and in courtyards. In effect, they pointed towards what they eventually got which was a traditional college in modern dress. 
although I insist this is a college, Churchill is a college that brought modernism into Cambridge. In fact, in many of its, um, if you like, social or structural aspects, it was by no means as radical in its thinking as some of the graduate colleges that came along in the mid 1960s. For example, Clare Hall, where um, living accommodation for families is fully integrated into the college, which was still unthinkable in Churchill in 1960, where there were to be some flats for married people, but they were banished to the edge of the site rather than integrated. Clare Hall has no Porter's Lodge, has no high table. So in many ways, it was the graduate colleges that could innovate in terms of planning uh, in a way that Churchill did not. So I think that it is true to say that Churchill is a traditional college in modern dress. And a small fact that I very much like is that if you go into the master's lodge, you will find servants' bells. Possibly the last private home in England uh, to be built with servants' bells. There are lots of nice touches in the brief. Um, I particularly like the specification that there should be space for 50 motor scooters. This is 1958, so they had visions of Lambrettas and Vespers to be parked uh, at the college that they were going to build. So 20 uh, competitors uh, were then invited. Now I've used this catch-all category of modernism, but there were um, many different kinds of modernists. And in effect, the profession was engaged in a war on two fronts. On the one hand, trying to beat back uh, the traditionalists, but on the other hand, there was a kind of civil war within the modernists. Some leaned towards the rather svelte, um, acceptable festival of Britain style. Others had much more uh, radical notions of what should be built. And if you look at the competitors, you find that um, the oldest of them were born at the end of the 19th century, uh, but the youngest of them, Alison Smithson, had just turned 30. Um, so there were the, if you like, the young Turks, the enfants terribles, as well as a slightly older generation of modernists. And this would guarantee a huge variety of uh, plans and schemes among these uh, 20. I've mentioned Basil Spence. Now, his role was as chairman of the um, five-person uh, judging panel, three architects and uh, two academics. And incidentally, the two academics on that panel were definitely going to be sympathetic to a modernist approach. They were uh, the man who soon became the first master, uh, John Cockcroft, who himself had uh, commissioned a very interesting Cambridge architect uh, to build his own house uh, before the war. Um, and the other was Noel Annan, the uh, rather radical young provost of King's College. Basil Spence was another influential figure. Here he is at the headquarters of, of the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects in Portland Place, welcoming Winston Churchill, doing the polite thing, although as we've seen, um, he and his colleagues had run rings around Churchill and the trustees. I mentioned Coventry Cathedral, which is Spence's most famous building. And although, of course, that's a cathedral and we're very much a secular college, there are very interesting aesthetic parallels between those two. The chairs in the nave at Coventry Cathedral are the same as the chairs in our dining hall. The same artists, John Piper, Epstein, Jeffrey Clark, uh, worked there and worked here. There are also a lot of interesting echoes between the two. Well, let's look at some, some of these um, 20 schemes that came in. And I want to next to show you um, a stylized uh, set of images uh, to show you the sheer variety of possible solutions. This is a schematized version of the college uh, site. Uh, this is Storage Way. That's the Maddingley Road. What we eventually built without, I've taken out the central buildings, the dining hall, etc., just showing you the 10 residential courtyards as built. So that's what we've got. This is what Shepherd actually submitted originally in his competition entry. Far more, 20 courtyards, smaller, many more of them. Historically, for comparison, that is Trinity Great Court. 
and that is Corpus Christi Old Court. So you can see the kind of scale that we're dealing with here. And all the others are different, some of the different schemes for Churchill College. And broadly, they divide into those who adopted versions of the courtyard scheme and those who abandoned completely the Oxbridge model of courtyards. Um, I think the dullest, which was exported to Warwick University, which in my view is the least successful architecturally of the Shakespearean seven, um, looks a bit like a housing estate of just some oblong blocks. Some went for tower blocks. And we'll have a look in a minute at what that might have seemed like. So this is the Smithson's project of interlinked series of tower blocks in the middle of the site. We're going to see in a minute this completely megalomaniac um, uh, project by James Sterling, which would have been the largest courtyard ever in Oxbridge. Um, or this also would have been a very large but open-ended courtyard. Variations on a scheme much more informal than, of course, the traditional quad. So these are different varieties of what was, uh, might have come to pass. And in the same way, the heights could have been very different indeed. Again, schematized for comparison, the three on the right are um, what exists in Cambridge. That's King's College Chapel with just one pinnacle here. <laughs> That's the university library. And in case we forget the fact, the tallest uh, building in Cambridge is in fact the Catholic Church there. That's what we built. That's our dining hall. That's our residential courtyards. These are what might have been built had the courtyard principle been abandoned altogether and high rise appeared on the Mattingly Road. And then the architect Casson wanted an obelisk, something symbolic that could match um, the Catholic church on the south side, a secular obelisk of extraordinary height there. And at least two of the projects wanted, God forbid, a huge, huge statue of Sir Winston Churchill. So those are some of the things that we might have got. And you see many varieties of this if you look at the Shakespearean seven universities. Broadly speaking, you can divide them into those that go for what you might call pavilions in the park, as at Sussex University, using the spread of the fields of the campus uh, fairly liberally, or concentrating your building in a tight urban structure as at Lancaster University or the towers at Essex University. So uh, different um, solutions. Well, that might have been Churchill College. This was, this is Essex University Towers. And if that looks to you a bit like the university library in its verticals, that's deliberate because this is the scheme that was designed for here. And architects hate binning schemes that they've produced and so they use them elsewhere, and it ended up at Colchester for Essex University. But that could have been us. And indeed, um, the plan was to have the Masters Lodge and the Penthouse Suite at the top. Well, let's come to the four shortlisted projects. This is easily the most famous and most often reproduced in books because it is the work of James Sterling and Gowan. Sterling, a name will be familiar to you as in the Sterling Prize, and is, I suppose, the most uh, best known of uh, second half 20th century British architects. Personally, I think overrated, um, but certainly bold in his schemes. This, I think, would have been uh, what I've called a megalomaniac scheme. The idea was to have a vast, residential courtyard raised on an earthwork there with a roof walk all the way around. This was very fashionable around 1960 and you get it versions of it in the, in the Barbican and so on. And then within the courtyard, the, more residential buildings, but also the communal facilities, the dining hall and so on. Um, not, I think, the master's lodge, which is out here. This little building here is the college library, which would have looked like that. Now, again, architects, um, of course, develop an idiom. And very soon after this, in the ensuing years, Sterling would go on to build what is known now as the Red Trilogy, 
um, Leicester University Engineering Building, the notorious, if I may call it, History Faculty Building in Cambridge, and the Florey Building in Oxford. Uh, here is one of them. This is the Leicester University Engineering Building. So we might have had something like that. Well, another of the shortlisted schemes is by Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn, who went on to uh, build the Barbican Centre in London. I think it's a very interesting scheme, but I can see why it wasn't successful. It looked too urban for a college. And the fact that his um, statement included words like precinct and piazza didn't, just didn't sound collegial enough. Um, he also seemed a bit um, fanciful in having this very tall carillon bell tower above a porter's lodge. That's the porter's lodge with a bell tower. But I think what's fascinating about this project is it's the only scheme that took seriously the fact that three colleges were about to be built at once. New Hall, now Murray Edwards, Fitzwilliam and Churchill. And he proposed closing Stories Way and creating a centralized uh, piazza to join them all together and also to have a ramp bridge that would take everyone's bicycles uh, over the Madeline Road towards town. Um, I mentioned the Barbican. Um, these, you can see the similarities here. These will go to the Barbican. I particularly like the dons here with their gowns and mortarboards pointing to the distance there. So this is the uh, Chamber of Pound Bond scheme. Then the scheme that is widely regarded, unofficially at least, as the runner up is this one by HKP, Howell, Killick, and Partridge. This is a stunning, very seductive image. It's by um, Barbara, in fact, her name is here, Barbara Jones. That's right. I, someone should do a um, dissertation on her. She's a very interesting commercial artist of that period. What's very clever about this image is that it deliberately anchors together a vision of modernity and futurity with a vision of traditional Cambridge. So here is a stunningly modernistic building, far more daring than what got built, with its zigzag um, dining hall roof here. And the characteristic of this firm, for all their future buildings, of completely concrete clad facades. And look what they're going to do. They're going to have a lake. There's a punt, punting. There's a student sitting on the lawn with swans. So, uh, and there's a jet aircraft flying overhead. So deliberate bringing together of images of futurity and reassuring traditionalism of the backs of Cambridge. And zaniest of all, an island in the lake, and they actually proposed that Winston Churchill would be buried on that island. There's his gravestone there. Many architectural commentators felt that that should be built. That should have won. And I can see why. But it probably would have looked like that, which is the same firm exporting to Oxford, or that also in Oxford. Those are St. Anne's and this is St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Their characteristic use of uh, concrete um, for pods, if you like, for their uh, fenestration, for the windows. Well, I'm going to stop in a few uh, moments because this was the heart of it, some of those schemes. Let's see what Shepard himself produced, the winning scheme. Now, the trouble with competitions is you don't really get much interchange with your client. You're doing, you're, you're, you're driving um, in the dark, if you like. And this scheme that he submitted and won on actually doesn't look a lot like what he eventually built. Uh, the uh, residential courtyards are approximately similar, but he still hasn't done what he will do, and I'm glad he did, is to punch out um, cantilevered uh, windows with their distinctive window seats that we all love. That hasn't yet happened. But look, the central building is almost nothing like that at all. It was going to be clad in Portland stone. We don't yet have the barrel vaults. It's raised on Pilotti. The, the, the college library is not at right angles to this as it became, but is beyond it axially. This is, we're looking from the front here, the college on Stories Way. And lo and behold, 
the statue of Sir Winston Churchill there. Thank goodness we're not having to deal with that issue now. I love this perspective. Now he has punched out the windows. But of course, as you know, the college was single sex at the beginning, and yet Shepherd deliberately included here a rather interestingly purposeful, possibly even cross looking woman walking across, striding across the site. I particularly like that image. There are two models of the college as Shepherd envisaged it. And this is the first model, um, which uh, is, uh, goes with the image we've just seen. So um, we're looking in that previous image there, we're looking from around about here towards the statue, past this building here and the residential buildings here. Uh, this is the chapel at the front. And he designed 20 courtyards, 20. But we ended with 10. The building committee insisted that these courtyards were too small and a great many changes occurred in the design. This is the second model. We now have 13 courtyards of which 10 were built. We don't of course have the Western, the Western flank is open vista now, but we do now have this wonderful dining hall as built with the triple barrel vault, this great barrel vault here. But look, here's the chapel with a ba triple barrel vault echoing that, but at right angles to it. And as members of Churchill College will know, uh, after a great row, the chapel was cut out. Indeed, it's said that literally Cockcroft got out a knife and cut it out of the model. These are the squash courts. So we do now see roughly what uh, would occur. Now, in the, my last couple of moments, um, I want to just uh, say a, a thing or two more. Um, sometimes people call this a brutalist college. And um, what I think is the case is that there are what, are called, what we might call brutalist essays. Uh, what saves the college, many feel, is the amount of brickwork that is used. But at various points, there are wonderful displays of uh, expressive concrete, such as the vents for the boiler house. In fact, in 1960, when Britain was uh, struggling to be a uh, industrial power, the um, constructors of the college published this image of the college's own dreaming spire, the boiler house chimneys, uh, as if to give the impression that this scientific college was going single-handedly to revive British industry, and that this is what a new college was all about. Not, not spires, but uh, concrete and steam and smoke. There's our concrete. And possibly the only college in Oxford, surely, that has a concrete, cast, cast concrete foundation stone. Well, it's, it's brutalist, um, though saved by its brickwork. This is a very early photograph of the brickwork. But in my last thought, the last two minutes, is just to say something about the most uh, inspirational building behind it. There are many influences on the college, particularly uh, Scandinavian brick architecture, Alvar, Alto and others. But there's no doubt that there's a single building that influenced Shepherd, and that is a little house in the outskirts of Paris, the Maison Jaune, by Gropius, late Gropius, uh, sorry, Corbusier, late Corbusier. It's a small private house, quite rather roughly finished, but it was quickly taken up in the British architectural press and by other architects. Um, and uh, this telltale use of horizontal bands of structural uh, concrete exposed uh, on the outside, uh, leaving the um, floors between to be infilled with brick or with, um, with uh, windows and woodwork, or those distinctive um, narrow slit windows. This uh, was a couple of years later, housing uh, flats by Stirling, again using that idiom. And here in Cambridge, the little extension to the architecture department built in 1959 by Sandy Wilson. And it was in 59 that Corbusier himself came to Cambridge to receive an honorary degree. So by a nice coincidence, the very moment that our competition was underway. And Sandy Wilson showed Corbusier this little gesture to Corbusier that he himself had designed. And uh, Sandy Wilson said it was rather like uh, being Adam showing God around the Garden of Eden. 
And a lot of people cottoned on to this kind of style. And my last image is this. It's um, Basil Spencer's Sussex University. And I include that because it's a scaled up version of that uh, late Corbusian idea, um, very similar uh, uh, to the college. They're using red brick, Sussex University. And I leave that there because I was an undergraduate at that university. Thank you very much indeed. I just also wanted to say that um, for those online, they can um, use the question and answer function on Zoom uh, to send in questions, but we'll take all the questions at the end after Martial's talk. So. Suppose I'm okay here, it's fine, yes? All right, well, after this fantastic, very good talk by Mark, um, which explained very well the evolution, the, the starting point of the college. My talk will be rather boring and pragmatic, is what has been happening since the competition uh, uh, around the college. So it's the evolution over 60 years of college life and building. And in fact, the evolution really reflects changing uh, requirements for the college. You know, starting initially, essentially, uh, as an undergraduate, purely undergraduate college, it evolved to incorporate the postgraduate, which are about the same numbers of undergraduate and postgraduate now, and the post educational um, or continue education with the Muller Center. So it has been a change in functionality in the college. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is the kind of priorities that we had evolved during the years of the 60 years from a very kind of functional, pragmatic and really modernist building to more concern of environmental uh, sustainability as well as being more inclusive to, in our um, uh, undergraduates or graduates. So to start off, I will just take the final um, uh, scheme uh, shown by, by Mark, and you can see that a reduction of the number of support and one very important issue, the opening towards the field in the back, which changed substantially the college. And essentially the idea came out from there. Now, what I will do, I will divide in two parts my presentation. One is the new buildings added to the college because of new functions coming in. And the second part will be remodeling of existing buildings. So starting with this uh, slightly uh, all because the Cowan Court is not here, um, aerial view, you can see that the alteration are mainly connected with the 1960 building, which were a sort of developed over the 60 years. And the new buildings included, well, essentially was infilling the concourse, the battery, the gallery, and so on. And then the development of the graduate area, which is quite new, starting with uh, the Wilson flat, uh, which is the first uh, graduate accommodation there, the chapel, as you know, and then the Muller Center, which is the continuous education development in the 1990s, and the pepper pot, which is increasing graduate uh, development, a new flat just recently done. And, um, the study and music center. And then the Cowan Court, which is the le last building which we have had for undergraduates. So the part one, new buildings, these are all the main buildings from David Roberts, Wilson Flat, up to Coachella and Vermeulen, three houses for postgraduates. So they are about eight or nine big buildings. 
So starting with uh, the graduate area, which is uh, the first development by, um, by the college in, to get graduates in, into the college. And it was a really interesting building. It's a very good, the layout is very good. It has this court, grass court, which is very important for the children of uh, married uh, people, students, and sort of single room up there. And I think it was built with very little money. So, you know, the service internal, in, in, they were very primitive and it was remodeled and re refurbished later on. So the other new buildings, as you know, was a chapel, which originally was supposed to be in the front of the college. And uh, you know the argument against the chapel. So finally, the college developed this in a land which doesn't belong to the college, but to the trustees of, of the chapel. So technically, and, but in that place, um, it has been an idea of developing a multi-purpose hall here at the East Art Building, which hasn't happened, but it was proposed many years ago. The other big development is the archive, 1971-1973, done by Shepard Robson. And the extension, when the addition of the stacks of papers came in and was extended by David Fellows. Um, by the way, you can see that the, the bricks, the original bricks were no longer in production. So they are different kind of bricks, but similar in, in form, in texture. So the, the graduate area um, accommodation, this is to me one of my biggest battle uh, in this uh, since I was a, a elected fellow here because we needed to have more accommodation for graduates. So we designed a little sketch to raise the money for developing this graduate accommodation. Unfortunately, we only got about 900,000 pounds, which we couldn't do very much. So the, the developer, uh, the development director, Keith William, went to a, a firm of design and build and said, what you can do for 900,000 and produce this atrocity here, which I, when I saw it, I said, well, if you build this, I will resign. Uh, thank goodness, um, the master at the time, Bondi, said, oh, we cannot build something that our director of studies will disapprove so violently, so we need to get some more money. So we started going around with, uh, you know, trying to get some more money. And I'm not sure how he got uh, in touch with uh, Mr. McKinney Muller, which as you know, gave us a, not a lot of money for developing this, uh, the Miller Center. But it was interesting because I went and explained to him with uh, Bondi, the master, um, and explained what we wanted to do. I said, he looked at it and said, that's too small. I said, I said well, we can do it bigger, I said. Oh, but, you know, just graduate, you need to be more important, he said. This is, uh, I said, well, we can invent something, I said. Mm -hmm. I said well, and then this idea of a continuous education was, was actually developed on the hoop there. So it was, and he took it uh, very seriously and thought it was wonderful idea. So we went and designed again a competition with again selected, um, a group of selected um, architects, including the Danish architect, he, he was very keen on Mr. Miller, who was Henny Larsen, and produced the first design uh, for, he, for the new Miller Center, which is that, which actually was built in this form. He was a very difficult architect. Uh, we had a lot of arguments, um, but anyway, he produced a quite distinguished, distinguished building. But this part was for the graduates, the original scheme that we wanted to build, and the rest was for the continuous education, uh, the Miller Center. Later on, uh, because of the expansion of the Miller Center, this area was taken over as well by the Miller Center. So with that money, we built some more 
uh, flat for graduates. So um, another uh, graduate um, uh, area was the uh, David Fellow, which at the time was a college architect. We, because I was doing you know, most of the work as a college architect without getting any pay for it and getting all the flack for anything that happened there. So we decided to get a, a college architect and the first college architect was David Fellow, um, who did very good work. But I think he, uh, the Miller Center needed to have a study center for big conferences. So he proposed, he proposed to this atrocity, which I thought it was really awful. So I convinced him to change it. And finally it was built a much more sensible way in next to the, um, the change room, you know, the cricket, cricket pavilion area. And we added, uh, he added this design, which looked very, very, very good. Um, and it was an extremely successful uh, addition to the Miller Center. Um, then the next big, um, ah, because we got this money from the Miller Center, uh, we were able to build the graduates flat and we had a small competition which was won by Cottrell and Vermillion. In fact, designed by Simon Tucker, who was one of the former students here in Churchill. And it was a very interesting change of interest of rather than being just completely independent new building, they took care of merging with existing building like Whittingham Lodge. And you can see the kind of, although it's modern, it's a rented, rented interpretation of uh, that kind of architecture, which is a kind of ma uh, ma um, sort of merging into the environment rather than standing up against the environment. So I think it was an interesting change in, in the priorities at the college. So um, the other part was the extension of the uh, center and the music center which was won again by a competition by Deborah Sound of uh, um, uh, DHSA. And Deborah produced a very interesting scheme because uh, we needed to maintain the existing um, accommodation working all the time while it was built. But that meant um, that there was very little space in the site while uh, to build the building without interfering with the functions of the study center. So what she did, which I think is very clever, was to look and reflect the kind of nature in the building. So disappear in some way the, the building uh, uh, from, you know, in, it's very close to the, to the street, which I think it works very well in that sense. Then the final big building is the um, is Tom Emerson. Is the Cowan Court, which is the last uh, court in for postgraduate, above for undergraduate. And again, here you can see the kind of change in emphasis and uh, priority. First of all, here it is a real um, kind of environmentally sustainable building because it's all made of timber, and even recycling timber. You know, they come from French carriageway, you know, recycling uh, timber, oak. And, you know, as you know, timber has bonus, CO2 bonus, so, you know, because as they grow, the, the, the tree absorbs a lot of CO2. And of course, it's very cheap, uh, not cheap, uh, sort of very efficient in, in building because you don't need to have a lot of energy like in concrete and brick, which you spend a huge amount of energy in building. So it has an intention and very clear interest in sustainable architecture. Now it's becoming very, very important to do that. And the other aspect which is very uh, important to say is that it changed the traditional um, staircase base groups of the college in, for lift and corridors which allow people, um, you know, um, um, people in wheelchair reach any room in, in 
in the, in the complex. So we needed to abandon the idea of staircases with groups of, of rooms around it, which is a typical traditional uh, college structure to this kind of continuous balcony and side corridor which people can access, you know, uh, invalids and people like that. So as you can see, there is a change in attitudes uh, and priority. The final aspect, which has just been finished, is a, a continuation of the graduate um, development by Cottrell and Vermeulen. And as you can see, they have generated a kind of village around, uh, of, around the the Wilson uh, flats, and is all graduate accommodation, very much in line, and as I said, with um, Whittingham Lodge and the kind of houses that you have in Stories Way. So it blends in, although it's a new version in the modern way of art and craft, which does the, the latest big uh, development. Now, if I'm, uh, that's the, the design uh, competition. The second aspect uh, part, which I will just briefly is, um, go through, is the remodeling of the existing building. We started then uh, by the infilling of rooms in the courtyard from then, from 1975, when I was involved here, up to the next, uh, the permanent exhibition here in, uh, in the Wilson Hall. So if we start from the, the beginning here, you know, I, uh, the, the Bursa, who at that time was Howard George, was desperate for more accommodation, especially with ensuite uh, bathrooms and so on. So he persuaded me that we could use some of these empty spaces underneath the courtyard, like for example here, so we put Unsweet uh, toilets, uh, you know, the bit. and also we use corners which were not very useful for any any purpose to do either toilets or new or new accommodation. So that was the first thing that we did, and I think it works reasonably well. You know, can you see this? Where the kind of corners that you it didn't have any purpose at all. And we, we maintain the views, but not that part. So you could build this kind of development there and for, um, you know, um, handicapped people to arrive uh, to their rooms and having uh, toilets as well. So that was the first type of development of refurbishing um, the college. The next one was this. As you remember, while well, you came here probably, there was a big open air corridor here from the Porter's Lodge into the main building. And it was a windswept space with not very much use. Um, and Howell George again was desperate trying to get space for more, more administration uh, rooms. So I suggested to develop this, which was to enclose this corridor and um, build up um, new offices there. And I think it has been a, a great uh, success in that sense. Um, and, and, you know, once you get into the college, you walk within the space of the building. The other point I, uh, I wanted to say, uh, which is, is that now change again, is I suggested to have a bypass to the battery because the, at that time in order to get from the senior commons room to the dining hall we needed to go through the battery and a lot of undergraduates were playing you know billiards and they make fun of us by hitting us when we walk <laughs> through you know with a cue or standing the legs you know while you were working uh, walking there uh, so usually half drunk <laughs> the students. So I suggest it was better to have a bypass. So we build this, uh, but now it has been incorporated back again. So, it, but probably the students are more civilized now than in the 1970s or 80s. Anyway, um, the other thing is this aspect, which I thought it was 
you know, the connection between the uh, SCR and the uh, Cockroft room was this narrow corridor, very dark and dingy. And uh, we suggested uh, to move this where the, uh, the ladies' toilet here, to move it out and open up and created a, what we call the fellows gallery, which is quite light because we have a skylight from there and we, it has changed a lot. Uh, then we projected into the car park, you know, the ladies' toilet. And so we move it there. You can see still the base of that uh, toilet. So anyway, that's another. And finally, I think is the, the, the refurbishment of the Wilson flat, because um, as I said, it was built with very little money and it was desperate for improvement. So it was updated and all the toilets and kitchens and all that space. And it's very, very successful, I think. So, and then there have been other minor alterations, which by the college architects, Mary Bowman, which uh, extended relocation of toilet, um, uh, reconstruction of um, existing houses and so on. So there have been small changes as well there. So to, to finalize, you know, the college essentially used to be around this axis with mainly undergraduates here with the, the main functions of, you know, the dining hall and, and the library and, 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 and archive. But now has been a new, which was a back road here, mainly service road, for the kitchen, so has become a very important axis for the college, you know, because all of these are graduate accommodation, all of them, you know, with important buildings like, you know, the Miller Center, important, um, you know, concert hall and uh, study center, and all of these village type of development around uh, the top end of the site. So I think this we need to think about, again, it's not longer just a service road, but it's a main access to the college, which I have been sort of pushing that we need to do something about it. And we have had some, uh, you know, the, uh, a plan for the future, which that line, just a, you know, mob line, is the college road, which we need to really improve and develop. So we hope that we will do next in our development to increase the quality of and the presence of the college um, for the visitors as well as the people, as people who live and work here. So conclusion, continuity and respect to the original fabric has been very important over the 60 years. There have been an enormous amount of improvement. The roofs leak everywhere. So we needed to change progressively through better uh, roof system. The trouble with flat roof is they leak always. You know, being an architect, I know that. So I try very hard you know, to improve this roof with some kind of slope. We started with copper, which is very good, but the college found it very, very expensive. But we are coming back to that now. Uh, so we have been changing the roof over the year. The kitchens were restructured, the, new, the stairs as well, a lot of shower room being put into the building and so on. And then the new addition reflect new requirements like the graduate space as I have been talking about, the archive, the conference centers and so on. And the priority of time has, has been, of the time has changed, you know, to include, have people disabled as well as more sustainable, not only purely for the functional uh, buildings. And finally, uh, we need a long-term strategy for allowing potential future requirement and improve, as I say, the business of the college. So thank you very much.
thank you very much to both Mark and Martial for those fascinating talks. Um, we've got several questions that have come in on the Q&A um, on Zoom. So I'm just going to start off with one from um, the Zoom Q&A. Um, there is a question about uh, whether Churchill had any input into the schemes uh, to design the new college. Um, I think I don't know if the person missed what you said, Mark, but if you just want to briefly answer that. Well, uh, Winston um, Churchill had um, zero input. And as I uh, uh, tried to explain, um, his wishes and the wishes of the trustees were more or less completely bypassed by the whole yeah. process. Um, he, we don't really know his response to what he got, um, but um, I think he would have wanted something different. And, um, I, and it's kind of a linked question, I suppose. Rob Wheeler is asking how the trustees were maneuvered into a closed competition with uh, only modernist architects. Um, I don't know. Maybe. Well, as I understand it, basically because they created a buildings committee to which they delegated um, and then found that they had over delegated. Um, the two things they insisted on was not having a completely open competition, which might have involved well over a hundred uh, applicants for such a prestigious uh, scheme to commemorate Winston and New College in Cambridge, hugely prestigious. Um, uh, so they insisted on a limited competition and they insisted on a British architect, but otherwise uh, they were outmaneuvered by the buildings committee. And I think they, they probably put their trust in the two academics who were on it, um, Cockcroft and Annan. Uh, but in fact, those proved very sympathetic to, to what the architects intended. Thank you. Um, I might turn to the people here. Um, does anyone have a, a question from the audience here? So um, I think um, the person there was first. Um, in the grey jumper. The roving mic's coming around. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, um, Mr. Marcel. Um, I found it very interesting. Um, it, uh, just to pick up this, uh, perhaps a small point, but significant from what you said about the insulation of the roofs. Um, I have just had to deal with it on a small project myself and the feedback I got from the artisans was um, for slopes to be effective, they have to be large. Um, so really on the present setup, it seems it would fundamentally change the whole um, framework. Um, small slopes, he said, um, don't really work very well because they're are technologies today, um, such as putting um, gravel and, and larger layers, moisture absorbing layers, uh, which are apparently more sustainable as well, um, to deal with this problem. Um, is, is, do you have any reaction to that? Well, um, I think it's true to say that the bigger the slope, the better, the better is the, uh, the roof. Uh, there's no doubt about it, you know, it's very good. But, you know, if you have big roofs like that, it will destroy the, the kind of, uh, you know, style of the college. It's very interesting. There is one example. You know, the Master Lodge of Modeling College was a flat roof done by David Roberts as well. And it was, comp you know, leaks always. So they built a huge roof on top now, you know, enormous roof. They, they changed completely the, the vision and the style of the building. In here, we have respected that, but by increasing slightly, slightly the edge, you can see that there is two bands of copper now, the first one and the second one. And that allow us to have some slope but the slope, which we did, um, you know, it, it works very well, is copper, you know, which you fold the copper inside, and that is very, very good, and doesn't leak, and lasts hundreds of, of years, at least, we hope so. But, um, you know, it was done about two courts in that way. And then, you know, the birds have decided that it was too expensive copper, which really was expensive. So they use another kind of material, which I'm not very familiar. I hope it works, but I have my doubt because it's that kind of flat roof again. 
So, but I notice that now they are building and uh, in, in, they are changing. I haven't been very involved now in the college uh, architecture, but I notice that they are putting new copper roof in the corner there. So probably they are returning to the original idea which I have to do this kind of slope, small slope, but really, really well done with copper, which, you know, you fold the copper like this and they, they're very watertight. Thank you. Um, I think and Andrew, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think you mentioned one female competitor in the original competition. Um, uh, my impression is the gender balance of, of architects has improved over the years. Could you, could you comment? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it is true to say there was a single woman. I mean, obviously, some of these teams of architects, uh, the, the front men, as it were, the men on the, the names on the cover were male almost exclusively. Uh, but a lot of the teams in, included ours. And it's, it's important to say, quite apart from the, the gender question, that often the name on the tin uh, does not tell you who did the detailed work. Uh, Richard Shepherd has his name on the tin of this college, but much of the detailed design was done by one of his um, assistants, William Mullins, Bill Mullins, who died just a few months ago. Um, and he spent five years on site doing all the detail design. Um, and that team at uh, Shepherd it did include uh, um, uh, women. The one I named is Alison Smithson, who's, who's well known, at least if you're interested in 1950s, 60s architecture. Uh, husband and wife team, Alison Peter Smithson, whose two most best known buildings are the Hunt Stanton School, which made them instantly famous in their 20s um, in Norfolk and Hunt Stanton. Um, and then the Economist building, which was an export really of their scheme for here, of um, a series of twin of towers that were, were inter interconnected uh, in, in London. Um, and they were, I think, particularly inter influential, not just because what they built, but they were great publicists and great ideas people. Um, for example, their scheme for Churchill was very interesting in thinking hard about students um, not as sort of old fashioned undergraduates, but as young people needing uh, comfortable services. And so they were thought about creating uh, flats in effect, um, a, a kind of living and accommodation for young people uh, that, that re envisaged undergraduate life in a very fresh way. Thank you. Um, there's another uh, question from Sebastian Warmel um, saying, We have seen few interiors in the college. How much thought was given to the comfort of undergraduates and how did the original undergraduate rooms compare with those in traditional colleges? Well, they compared enormously well. Um, at first, um, you can imagine that much of Cambridge was very snooty about uh, Churchill College for all sorts of reasons. It was known as the Maddingley Road Tech because the snooty arts people uh, were disdainful of its science and engineering bias. Uh, and the modernism of it, people thought, simply didn't look like what a college should look like. No ivy up Gothic walls here. Um, but then the cruel winter of 1963 happened. And suddenly the whole of Cambridge was envious of Churchill, because Churchill undergraduates were the only warm students in Cambridge that, <laughs> that winter. And if you think back to 1960, um, it was still the case that coal was being pulled up staircases by college servants to heat, uh, to put onto coal fires in student rooms. And it was still characteristic, even much later than 1960, as that you put on your dressing gown and walked across a cold open courtyard to find the nearest um, bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, whereas at Churchill, there, was, there were uh, staircases provided with um, baths and uh, showers just for a few students. Every room had its own wash basin. And above all, it had central heating, which was unimaginable for 1960. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add anything, Monsieur? No, no, I'm, I'm saying that uh, the actual design of furniture has been kept here, you know, the original one in very well. So it has stood the test of time, really comfortable, very well built, and most of the furniture of the college. Thank you. Um, yes, would you? Thank you very much indeed for two fascinating talks. As one of the students who came here in 1964, I certainly appreciated the, uh, the heating and the comfort and, uh, and, and the general atmosphere in these wonderful buildings. Um, but uh, 
I wonder uh, what, looking towards the future, um, the, uh, the calculations have been about energy consumption, uh, and in particular about uh, carbon emissions, and whether there are any plans in the future to reduce these, perhaps to a net zero? Then, uh, well, I think um, it's a very good question. I think the idea of the cow and cover, which is a later one, is exactly in connection with that. In fact, we didn't put, um, originally it was an idea of putting solar panel there and um, uh, what you call it, um, ground source heat pump. Unfortunately, you know, when you add up the cost of that, it was much more expensive than just connecting to the boilers that we have, which were pretty, we have replaced the boiler. But now we are, I mean, the, the building committee, as, as I understand, they are thinking of putting, putting panels everywhere, uh, solar panel uh, on, in the roof, which will change a, a bit the, the, the vision of the, of the, of the college, you know, the view of the college. But I think it will be a good idea, you know, to have a, a solar panel on, because we have vast extension of roof space there. And eventually substitute uh, the whole of uh, the gas consumption that we have now by solar. And, uh, and we can also do the um, uh, heat pumps. I, I have been involved in a scheme like that. And the heat pumps, they are not excellent yet but probably will be in the future uh, very, they are very expensive by the way, you know, it's an expensive way of doing it, but eventually will come down as the solar panel has come down. Um, and I suspect that this will be the priority in the next few years to actually eliminate all the, the gas uh, consumption and electricity from there that aspect you know so hopefully it will be done the bursar is even hopefully talking of exporting electricity to the neighboring colleges once we've put solar panels on the roof on the no, roofs. No, no, no. <laughs> so. um sorry there was another question do you still yeah. have because you had your hand up before so thank you um um, enjoyed your talks very much. I, I, I just want to ask both of you a question, if I could be very naughty. Um, firstly, I, I wondered what, what objections you had to a statue of, of Sir Winston. It, it seems sort of the obvious thing to do, really, although obviously we, we accept that the college itself is its statue, if you like. And the other things about the Muller Center, I, I just wonder on what basis the, the brick was chosen there, because to my eyes it looks much too light and doesn't blend in at all with the college structure. Well, I'd make two points about the, uh, the statue. Uh, one is uh, an aesthetic and uh, one, I think, is that um, we actually have an unwritten rule that in our public spaces, not indoors, in our public spaces, we only have abstract art. And that's in keeping with, with the 60s idiom uh, of not having symbolic art in the public spaces. Uh, and I think you've hit on a small, uh, very important point there, that it's, the whole college is a memorial to Churchill. And I think it's better that a living organic institution memorializes rather than that you have all the um, in, traditional impedimenta, if you like, of, I don't know, wall plaques or statuary. Uh, that would make it, I think that would have locked the college visually into the war, Second World War almost, um, rather than the sense of a living institution and a continuing institution. But much more materially, uh, I don't know how much you know, and I'm certainly not going to go into it now, but we've had a hell of a time in this college in the last year because of the culture wars uh, that are sweeping the Western world over Churchill. We had daubed on the wall of this college a few months ago, Churchill was a racist. Now, let's not go there uh, and have that debate. You can do that privately. But I think that were there uh, big public statues of Churchill in the middle of the college, we would be having an even worse time at the present. Yes, you know, probably will, somebody will suggest to put face in the wall <laughs> <laughs> as the case of Oriel College, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I, I think it is true what Mark is saying that has been a tradition here in the college for modern art, absolutely sculptures, paintings in general. Um, very, you know, there is no concession in some ways 
to any kind of other type of modernity, you know, always. And, and it's, I think this is part of the ethos of the college. Now, in the question, in relation to your bricks uh, in the Miller Center, that was a big argument I had at the time. I thought it would be nice to have the same bricks because actually at the same manufacturing brick, they had the same stock from Peterborough. Uh, but um, Henny Larson, the, the Dane, uh, Danish architect, wanted to paint it white, the whole thing, because he always had all his buildings white, absolutely white. And finally, after a lot of argument with him and Mr. Miller, um, you know, we say we compromise being bricks, but a lighter color. And I wasn't very happy, but the, the, the master at the time, you know, uh, um, said to me, you know, come on, you cannot argue with the people who is coughing up 10 million pounds, you know. <laughs> uh, so I said, well, I have argued for, I remember arguing about the kitchens. You remember the kitchen were supposed to be underground in there, you know, finally we changed it. Um, it was very hard. It's a, it's a very good architect, by the way. And, uh, but very stubborn. And, and in <laughs> fact, you know, when Mr. L uh, Miller came here, um, he was pretty old, you know, probably for the 10 years and anniversary, I don't know. He, he looked at me and, said, and he remembered me about that. You were right, said, Kenny, it's impossible. He sacked him. He, you know, Miller um, financed the, the art complex in Copenhagen. And he sacked Henny Larson as an architect in midway <laughs> the design <laughs> because he's like, it's impossible is that but it's true it was difficult but he's very good architect and no doubt about it so that was a, a kind of compromise of being just a white facade but it was a brick of a lighter color yeah. thank you um there's there's quite a few more questions uh on the zoom q a so i'll just uh, let that there's a question about how the artworks, the sculptures that, that you've mentioned before, how they chosen. Um, so it was a deliberate, you said it was a deliberate um, decision to have abstract, how were they? Yes, I, I, I can't give a detailed answer about the um, nature of the choices. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's a habit as much as anything, that while indoors, we're perfectly happy to have representational sculptures and there are plenty of them about and portraits and so on, outdoors we do not. Um, as for the original choice, I think um, Richard Shepherd made a lot of the choices of who would be involved in providing some of the artwork, because some of the artwork is, is built into the fabric. If you think, for example, of our entrance gate, which you hardly notice because it's purely symbolic, it's the, it's the aluminium gate that swivels on its own axis at the Porter's Lodge. Since the college doesn't have a wall around it, uh, it was purely symbolic and it's on very rare occasions actually swiveled and closed. But that's by Geoffrey Clark. And I think it was the architect Shepherd who commissioned that. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the doors of the um, uh, archive center, the big ceremonial doors are also aluminium. And I think they're Geoffrey Clark as well. Mm -hmm. um, Geoffrey Clark mainly, I think, did ecclesiastical work uh, in, in, his, in his career. Um, and quite a lot of uh, sculpture in metal. Um, so I think that was his choice. Um, the um, lot of the internal fabric, the earliest fabric in our, and our, um, furniture was designed by Lucien Day and Robin Day, another husband and wife team who did huge amounts of um, design work for British interiors, from ocean liners to uh, John Lewis stores and so on. Um, in the 1950s and 60s uh, and designed for here. And a particularly funny moment several years ago was that there was an exhibition in London of the work of Robin and Lucien Day, which included um, a, a, an example chair from our senior common room. Mm. So this is a chair that I sit on every day, but there it was with a label saying, do not touch <laughs> <laughs> in, in this London exhibition. I think it was mainly the architects who chose yeah. most of the furniture and but the big sculptures that we have has been always lent to the college and we lost the most fantastic moor you know you when you came here you probably 
you, you had these fantastic reclining figures. Unfortunately, when we discovered, well, maybe that we knew from the beginning, they was just in on loan. So when when Moore died, you know, the foundation took it away. So it's a real, real pity. So fantastic. Thank goodness the the Hepworth one is owned by the college. It was donated finally. Um, but I think by Barbara, is that, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and the other uh, most of the college sculptures that has been sort of on loan. Um, you know, as a way of promoting their work, you know, some of them. So it, it depends very much who is willing to give us something which we like, and uh, we put it down, you know, that, uh, in the grounds. Yeah, I, th I think the Hepworth is actually on le on permanent loan, but the Hepworth Trust still has an input into, into so yeah, so it's not been given entirely. It does, um, a so yeah, the trust does mm, mm, take an interest. Um, mm. So. Um, there's another question about the whether all the undergraduate rooms were the same size with the same facilities in the original scheme. All the undergraduate. Yeah, all, all the, the rooms yeah. were the same. They were all. They the no, no, well, they weren't actually massive. No, they, they, they were. They were the fellows' suites. No, well. no, there were two kinds of undergraduate rooms. There were single study bedrooms, yeah. and then there were lots of sets, small sets with the, the second room. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah. it was the smaller of those rooms which were then later converted into our en, en suite. But normally, you know, they were taken by the fellows. I remember seeing, you know, I didn't get one of them, I, but a lot of the fellows, they well, have their own rooms. I think the answers can come from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yes. Yeah. It's a very, as, as the earlier generation will know, at the beginning, uh, we only were able to provide accommodation for two years at most, and uh, uh, the other year, or more than one year, you lived in digs, uh, old-fashioned digs. Well, that whole ethos has, has, has left Cambridge now, and it's, uh, you know, every college, I think, more or less guarantees to provide accommodation, if not directly in the college, at least in um, outposts of the co of the college, and I think that's a very important selling point for Cambridge that, that accommodation is guaranteed for all undergraduates now. Yes, in, in Churchill we have enough mm. rooms for all the undergraduates, which is very good. And it provides the simple maximum for the number of undergraduates we will admit. Um, so there's a couple more questions. Um, Mark in Bristol is asking about um, the point regarding the copper lasting hundreds of years. Is there any reason to believe the concrete will not last that long? Well, <laughs> the, the trouble that concrete permeates water through, so it's not a question of the concrete, is what you put on top is, doesn't last long. You know, it gets through the the felt you put or whatever system you have in the flat roof. Is the thickness of the concrete important? Um, but the, the, we don't have concrete roof. No, no, no. no, 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 no. We have, we have a, a really um, a kind of timber structure. Mm -hmm. And then on top we have the, the felt or the mm -hmm. whatever system we have. But now we have the copper on top. Yeah. But I think our concrete is in a much better state than some buildings of that generation. Oh, yeah. Um, right. And the Richard Shepherd had built a building just before Churchill College for Imperial College in London, which mm. was demolished 10 years ago, because partly because it suffered from concrete sickness. Yeah. So, I mean, that and the last two online questions we've got are related to that. Um, someone asking how much maintenance do the buildings need and uh, about the degradation of the concrete and how much maintenance have we had to do here? Yeah, we have had problems with that, you know, the last problem with aluminium, I think there was some problem with it. We needed to replace some of the concrete uh, fascia. But in general, we calculated, I'm not sure if it is I'm up to date on that, that we need to think about in terms of maintenance and renewal about 2% of the value of the college. Mm -hmm. And that's what we budget for. Because you need to upgrade the electricity, the system, the upgrade, you know, the loose um, and so on. And for example, the heating system as well needed to be upgraded because they are, after 50 years or 60 years, they were really in the last leg. 
So we, we budgeted for 2% per year of maintenance of the, of, the, of the value of the college, of building costs. Um, and uh, the, the same person is asking about, can you anticipate how concrete weathers, um, you know, whether you get what type of deterioration you get? Well, as, 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 uh, oh. um, well, we don't have a lot of problems with concrete, apart from those lintels in some, some part, but we seem, seem to be okay. Um, as far as we know, as far as I know. Uh, so we don't expect to have real problem in the exterior, apart from the roof, it has been. Uh, so hopefully it will not be any problem there. I think Michael wants to say something. Oh, well, actually two questions, so maybe one each. Um, Mark, which parts of the college are actually listed and how might that affect further development in terms of building in the environs of a listed building if we want to outfill? Mm. And the second question is concerning underground. When the college was built, because the water table is very high in Cambridge, there was virtually nothing underground. In fact, I think we famously have a wine cellar which is above ground. Um, but technology has moved on 60 years later, and it's far cheaper and easier and economic. And in fact, it can be quite climate friendly to build underground now. And we have the um, staff car park and the Merce, uh, Muller Centre car park. Um, car park's pretty ugly, a bicycle shed even. If they could be put underground, could we not beautify above and build additional accommodation? Is, is underground possible in the next 60 years? So two questions. Well, I'll take the first of those. Um, the whole of the original buildings by Shepherd, completed in 1973 with the archives. So the last residential courtyard was 1968, and then he added the archive center in 1973. All of those original set of buildings uh, were listed grade two in 1993, when a slew of about six or eight uh, post-war collegiate buildings were all listed at once. They were the first listings of post-war university buildings in Cambridge, uh, New Hall, um, the Cripps building at uh, St. John's, um, the William Stone building at Peter House, uh, Fitzwilliam College, uh, several, several at once were, were listed. And that of course does quite rightly place restrictions on what we can do with them. You need listed building consent. Uh, and I'm glad to say our newly uh, recently appointed head of estates, Tom Bowden, is a member, as I am, of the 20th Century Society, which exists to, uh, as a campaigning body to help preserve the best of 20th century architecture. And um, he is uh, very um, respectful of the original uh, fabric, um, which, uh, and I think it's true to say that, that um, all of our developments, except the archives extension, um, have been beyond the curtilage of the uh, original buildings, uh, so that we haven't really had to confront in a big way the question of, of radical change to the original listed buildings. And the great thing about this is it's got such a unit, it was all built by the same designer, same architect within just a very few years. Uh, so there's a unity to, to the original college. Yes, um, I would like to add that um, actually you can modify List to building grade two very easily. It's not a real problem, provided it's sympathetic and makes sense. Um, if we're two star and one, that would be very difficult, you know, very difficult. So, but it, of course, you need to go through list of building uh, permission to do any kind of change, you know, to anything in, in, the, in the list of building. But I don't think it's a major impediment to change aspects. Or the, or the building, if needed to be. So, um, and as Mark said, it's essentially the all, all part of the college which is listed, the rest is not. But, you know, there is part of the conservation area, the, all the frontage to the, to the to storage way. So that are protected as well. All the, all the houses that we, we own there, so need to have list uh, one conservation area which 
also it has some kind of uh, um, protection as well. Now, in relation to underground, uh, it's very expensive to, to build an underground car parking, but I agree with you, you know, ideally. In fact, um, the Miller Center, uh, part of the plan we had, uh, it, it is possible to expand that area or another block, you know, on top of the car park, and then that will be very sensible to, to put the car park as underground. You know, and then you can build something on top if you want to, you know, to expand if was necessary to expand the Miller Center, you know, you could, you could do. And also, I think it's, it's not very nice, all the car parking in the, the back here, you know, in the, in the next to the kitchens and all that area. That doesn't look very good, especially when you enter through that main road, which I think is a, uh, uh, um, there current situation which need to be improved. So it, it may be possible to do, but it costs a lot of money to, to park cars on the ground. Um, and I think the, the question of, uh, I think it's not so much the water table here, but it's all clay. I think it's underneath, it's mainly clay. So that's very difficult because, you know, with water expansion, the clay moves. So it's not easy to build underground in clay. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we've come to the end of our allocated time. So I, I just want to thank uh, Marcel and Mark another time. And thank you so much for your talk. And thank you all for your questions as well. And, and thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.